three. Oh. Joining me now is a personal friend, but more importantly, a great friend of Father Hesper, who uh, back in the early 70s became Father Hesper's personal driver, plus director of transportation, a few other things, Marty Ogren. How did you get that job with Father Hesper to become his go-to guy, including, and we'll mention it later, taking him to his farewell cemetery? Yeah. Well, Digger, I started uh, working at the Nordic Garage in August of 1975. And uh, almost on a daily basis, I got to know Father's driver, Carl Paris. Car uh, Father's car was parked in the garage, and Carl and I would interact, became friends. About a year later, I got a call on a Friday afternoon, and Carl indicated he uh, wasn't feeling very well and asked if I would drive Father <laughs> to O'Hare. I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it. I hung up the phone and I said, uh-oh, what have I done? <laughs> First off, growing up in South Bend, Indiana, I was aware of Father Hesburgh and his reputation had never met Father Hesburgh, so I'm intimidated. The second problem is I've never been to O'Hare Airport. So I go in and I tell my boss, I said, I think I've made a mistake. And uh, he says, let's go. And he was kind enough, we hopped in his car on Friday afternoon and we drove to O'Hare. The next day, I'm parked behind Corby Hall, and Father comes out. He asked me a ton of questions, and by the time we got to Laporte, I was at ease with Father Ted Hesper. And, that's that's and amazing. We, yeah, that's right. You know, over the years, obviously, he's the godfather of the Civil Rights Act, and President Eisenhower, back in 57, asked him to do it. And then, of course, uh, there was one point, as you know and I know, Helen, who was the one running the office, um, yes. Father Hesburgh didn't have a commencement for graduation. And what did Helen do to him? So Father Ted tells the story, uh, and I can't tell you what year it was, but uh, for whatever reason, the scheduled commencement speaker had to back out. So uh, Father Ted says, boy, I don't know what we're going to do. And Helen said, well, why not invite the president, President Eisenhower? And uh, Father indicated, he said, there's no way we can get him on short notice, but Helen, if you write the letter, I'll sign it. Well, the rest is history. Father, or uh, President Eisenhower was commencement speaker that year, so. So Helen was the go-to person behind Helen the scenes. Helen got it done, absolutely. What do you think, as you look back over his years at the age of 97, his greatest achievement was here at Notre Dame? Well, I can tell you what he was proudest of, and that was uh, admitting women, making Notre Dame co-ed. There's no doubt in my mind that was what he was proudest of. And obviously now with a class of 2,000 freshmen, 1,000 are women and 1,000 yeah. are men, so it's 50-50. Absolutely. Outside of Notre Dame, Marty, he was more than just a university president. We talked about the Civil Rights Act, obviously, and what went on, and that was 50 years this past 2014, so he was able to live to see that happen. Yeah. But he was also really interested in immigration. Sure was. And what was he trying to achieve in that direction? Well, he co-chaired uh, several committees looking into immigration and what was the answer? You know, what was the right thing to do and how could you pull it off? And legislation was passed. Uh, obviously, it's a hot topic again today, but that's one of the things that he worked the hardest on. And then he got involved with the Knight Commission, which was in concerning about graduation rates yeah. with student athletes. And he was the leader of that. And yeah. they would meet in Washington, D.C. and go after the direction of bringing back credibility not just yeah. Title Nine, Nine, Title Seven, Title Nine, but academic credibility for students to become student athletes and graduate with a degree to mend something. That's exactly right. He co-chaired the Knight Commission, and they worked very hard and uh, came out with a huge report on how to reform college athletics. It was a sad, sad day, February 26th, Thursday, which is hard to believe. It's over eight weeks ago. You were there that Thursday, four hours before he passed, and what's your reflections on that moment? Um, because of my relationship with Father, it was very tough uh, to see him in that condition. But at the same time, what a great life. It was time to go. He wanted to go, missed Father Joyce terribly. And uh, I can only imagine at the homecoming he got from Mary when he <laughs> walked through those gates. I mean, that's so, so it was time. Okay, but you had one more ride with Father Hesper. You drove yeah. from the Basilica, the hearse with the casket in the back, 
when you were around that curve to go down and go up to get to the cemetery, what reaction did you get when you saw the student body lined on both sides of the road taking Father Ted to his grave? Well, Digger, I was at the funeral, and uh, that was tough emotionally, just dealing with the actual funeral, the beautiful mass. So I walked outside to prepare to get in the hearse, and uh, I knew there'd be people outside the basilica, and there were, there were tons of people. And I knew I had to keep myself composed to be able to drive the hearse. So I got in the car and I said, Father, hold on, one more trip. Hmm. And I, everything was fine. And when we, we got in front of Corby, I'm fine. But when we made that turn to go downhill and I saw those thousands of students, um, I got a lump in my throat and I had to look down at Father O'Hara's feet because I couldn't, I couldn't look at the students. I had the window down because the seminarians who served as pallbearers were right. walking next to the hearse. So I wanted to be able to talk to them. Am I going too fast, going too slow? So with the window down, the silence, the respect, you could hear a pin drop. And when I would drive by the student's sign of the cross, about the last 100 yards in front of the cemetery, ROTC yeah, student. Yeah, that was, that was, and boy, that was a tearjerker. When they uh, came to attention, uh, it, it's good the cemetery wasn't far away. So what, <laughs> yeah. a, what a moment. Well, Marty, I, I've known you for a very, very long time. And uh, very fortunately, I just spent time with Melanie in talking about Father Hesburgh in the office. And I would say the two closest people to Father Hesburgh outside of his friends, real friends, was Melanie Chapeau and Marty Ogren. And Marty, I really appreciate your life and what you did for that man because he had nothing but love, respect, and obviously we're all knowing yeah. where he is today. Yeah. Peace in heaven with the Blessed Mother.